I feel as though the moment we're in right now is a point that I've been waiting for for the last five years. When we started on YouTube, the way that we started and built and grew our business for the first four years, it involves a similar playbook to what we are putting in motion on, say, a TikTok shop and YouTube shopping. It involved pulling up uh, back then, kind of the legacy approach, I'll call it now, uh, or soon to be a legacy approach, yeah. is pulling a you know affiliate platform off the shelf, plugging in. For us, it was share a sale. And yep. that's a way, you know, our approach working with content creators in, in various ecosystems is much more uh, on the, the spectrum of relationship building opposed to a transactional relationship. Explore the minds and marketing strategies behind today's winning brands and businesses. Tap into the power of the creator economy with Earned by Creator IQ. Here's Connor Begley. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Earned. Today, I've got Paul, the co-founder of BK Beauty on the show. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks, Connor. Appreciate it. Huge fan of the show and excited for the uh, conversation ahead. Yeah, huge fan of yours, too. I think I've been following your journey on Twitter like a lot of other people, and uh, it's been so cool to watch. Super impressive. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. So let's talk about the brand a little bit. Not everybody's going to know BK Beauty, but you guys, viral TikTok sensation, particularly recently, you've passed $25 million in revenue, and you built this with your wife. Um, which is, you know, sounds fun and also challenging at times, I can imagine, like when there's disagreements. Um, tell me about the journey. Tell me about the brand. Um, tell me about what it's like to work with your wife on the other side of the table. Yeah, absolutely. So so TikTok, obviously, TikTok shop, it's it's a more recent phenomenon within the last year. But our story really began five years ago. Actually, last week, last Thursday, we celebrated uh, the five-year anniversary of launching BK Beauty. And so we launched back August 1st, 2019. Um, and so, uh, but our story really started many, many years before that. My wife, Lisa, um, she is the one that really brings kind of the, the expertise to the beauty space. She was a professional makeup artist and then also a, a regional trainer at Mac Cosmetics 20 years ago. When we first met uh, 20 years ago, it was when she landed her dream job at, at Mac Cosmetics. And along the way, you know, she always had that passion for beauty. But in that role with Mac, she started to really get attached to the educational component. Being a trainer, she would travel around, train all the other Mac artists on, on technique, product, and that was her world. And ultimately what that led to 10 years ago was her taking to YouTube and starting a YouTube channel. This was early days of YouTube. There really wasn't um, a strong uh, and well-defined outlet to monetize that content. And it was a pure outlet for her passion putting out videos nights and weekends while she still had a day job. And she did that consistently for the last 10 years. And it wasn't until about three years into it, that journey, after she started building an audience and having consistency with the content she was putting out, that she started meeting other YouTubers and realizing she had an opportunity to monetize the content. And so slowly but surely, she started uh, figuring out the ropes of how to do that and was afforded, after a little while longer, afforded the opportunity to go full-time content creator. This was about maybe five, a little over five years ago, and so about six years ago. And at that point, uh, my my background is business and marketing. I spent the last decade in tech startup world. It was actually cybersecurity. And now I'm I'm working with my wife to sell, uh, you know, cosmetics <laughs> to women around the world. So it's it's been quite a 180 for for me but it's been from a marketing perspective it's been pretty interesting to see how well my skill set is translated to this new world um especially in in the world of digital commerce you know branding and and building that connection with with audience and so uh lisa and i we started connecting the dots realizing that we had an opportunity you know she, part of her monetization for her youtube channel was through paid affiliate links, talking and sharing about the products that she loved, educating people, women around the world on how to use those products. And she would earn a, a small commission for, for people, consumers and viewers on the other end who would, would purchase those. She also you know, worked directly with brands on brand partnerships. Uh, but we started looking at the data and really started to see that we had the opportunity on the table to leverage that foundation that she had built over many, many years with the audience and build our own brand, you know, from that. And so mm -hmm. uh, our approach, obviously, Lisa's approach coming from the passion and purpose that she brings to the table, and then ultimately pairing it with business ambition, what we experienced after we launched was just magic, magic 
I believe it really happens when you're able to pair the passion and purpose with business ambition. And so we had all those components in place to really hit the ground running. For me, when we were developing the brand, it was still nights and weekends for me. But mm -hmm. very quickly, I recognized that, uh, you know, right after we launched that we had much bigger opportunity in front of us that needed full-time attention to really uh, bring it to its full market potential. And so, so very quickly, I started to transition out of my, my former career, uh, partnered with my wife, Lisa, and we've been spending the last five years uh, growing the business together. It's been, it's been pretty incredible. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a great combination between the two of you guys um, that, you know, she brings the expertise and frankly, the credibility, right, when it comes to the actual product itself, which is super powerful. And, uh, you know, I have learned myself just creating content on LinkedIn. It's created a lot of empathy for people like your wife who have built these really large audiences. It's a lot of work. Like, it's an incredible amount yeah. of work. Um, yeah. And so hats off to her and hats off to you, too. You've got kind of a burgeoning Twitter career, it seems, as well, which is kind of fun. Yeah, I, you know, um, when we launched, it was direct to consumer. And so yeah. we, we, like many folks who, who got into the space, set up their, their Shopify storefront uh, and started selling to the public. And so for me, you know, I did bring to the table uh, skill sets from my background in marketing and business that definitely helped, um, you know, us package all that together. On, and the digital footprint um, and operations, but e-commerce was was a new world for me. I, I didn't I didn't understand it, and I needed to learn quickly. And I'm a huge believer that there's really no speed limit to learning. If you're mm -hmm. able to really tap into the veins of knowledge you need and the right places to accelerate that process for you, uh, connecting with other brand owner and operators directly and following them at first just you know, eavesdropping and falling from the outside, <laughs> but very quick, you know, it's that started to evolve uh, as we got traction and I was, you know, gaining knowledge myself, contributing back. And so over the last five years now, personally, I find a lot of value in, in sharing back. It attracts, I've found the right people to me that you know, we can then have personal conversations on a deeper level where I just am able to learn much, much deeper. And so yeah, I've enjoyed tapping into Twitter. I think for me, it takes a lot of my attention and time, but the the value I get in in return is is great. And at the end of the day, I, I'm sharing stuff that's in front of us, and it's it's our journey. And so it's very easy and natural to have a platform to share that on and engage with folks along the way. It's been it's been a, a rewarding part of of what I'm doing. Yeah, it's a it's really become quite the movement. This idea of um, the often call it building in public, right? Where you're building the company and then sharing good and bad things kind of along that journey in terms of what's working, what's not working in a way that like, you know, other people just don't know. It's like, well, how much money are you making and where are you making it from and what's working and what's not working? And so it's really, really cool to see what you're doing there. Have you, the only concern, like I had kind of pushed for us to do it a bit more aggressively and I do it personally a bit. The only concern I had was, you know, what if things start going not so well, right? What if things start to kind of turn as a business, which it hasn't for you guys, right? You're doing super well. But have you seen any downsides or any risks that you think about, like, as you're sharing this stuff? I think, you know, some of the folks I follow and engage with on Twitter and, and other private communities that are off Twitter, I find I learn the most valuable lessons from people who are sharing those those failures and, and stumbles along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so at some point, I'm definitely open to, to sharing those as they they come about. I think a lot of the the experiences we've had so far have been, you know, up and to the right. And um, and so that's been primarily the narrative that I've, I've been sharing. And I think for us, you mentioned uh, TikTok and some of the the traction we've gotten in, in that space and, and this kind of next wave of social commerce. I feel as though we've we've definitely positioned ourselves at the forefront of that, and mm -hmm. the playbook has not been written yet. This is new kind of pioneering territory, and I feel as though um, you know we're in in some way co-authoring that book. And it's I think the amount of things that I've started to share publicly has increased the further we've gotten on this new territory. And I feel as though we're we're in a position to share novel and new things that people have questions about and are curious about. 
And I have experience at this point that is is worth sharing. And so definitely over the last 12 months, I think the pace of, of sharing has has increased with with kind of this new territory that we're we're in today. Yeah, totally. I think the the thing that people underestimate, to your point about like the strength of these connections, and I felt it as well, is really thinking about kind of like who's reading this, not just like who's liking it, but who's reading it. And even though the audience, which for you is not small, but even though audiences may be small, the people that are reading it are often quite important, right? And it's weird because you telling somebody that is very different than them reading it when you're talking, you know, when you're posting it, it just has a different effect on people. It seems like for you, you've actually gotten a lot of attention of like the platforms too, right? Like I think Shopify featured you in their earnings call or Meta did, I can't remember which one, you know, TikTok's really starting to lean on you from like a product direction. It's pretty cool to watch that stuff take effect too. Yeah, that, that's been uh, super exciting. And again, being at the forefront, being able to connect with these, these teams, we love Shopify, we love the the, the teams over at TikTok we get to work with, uh, and and YouTube as well, uh, and so we're we're very dialed in and plugged in with with those teams, and it's been really cool to have influence on, you know, providing feedback and direction on where the future of social commerce is is heading. You know, these platforms, um, this this is effect. I, I feel as though the moment we're in right now is a point that I've been waiting for for the last five years. When we started on YouTube, the way that we started and built and grew our business for the first four years, it involves a similar playbook to what we are putting in motion on, say, a TikTok shop and YouTube shopping. It involved pulling up, uh, back then, kind of the legacy approach, I'll call it now, uh, or soon to be a legacy approach, yeah. is pulling a you know affiliate platform off the shelf, plugging in. For us, it was share a sale. And yep. that's a way, you know, our approach working with content creators in, in various ecosystems is much more uh, on the, the spectrum of relationship building opposed to a transactional relationship. And yeah. so back in early days and still today on platforms like like YouTube, our strategy involved sending out product samples to to creators who we wanted to experience our products and, sh and share them with their audience. Uh, and that's that was our, our approach. That was our radical focus. And we were able to support them through affiliate networks and sub affiliate networks that they were using to monetize their content and support the, the business that they run is creating content and sharing that with the audience. And mm -hmm. so that was our approach. And what TikTok shop has started to introduce and what we're seeing signs that other platforms are starting to shift towards is starting to integrate all of those features into a closed loop system all the way to the point of transaction. And so with that closed loop system, even going as far as facilitating the product sampling process. And so right now on any given day, we have inbound product sampling requests coming at us from, from folks on creators on TikTok, you know, upwards of 30 a day. The amount of overhead it takes for us now to act on those uh, product sampling, sending out product samples is much lower. Back mm. in the back in the, the past, uh, we would have to, you know, reach out, you know, we're, we're admirers of your content, we'd love to send you product. And there's this back and forth. Um, some people would respond and get back to us. And then another step is getting shipping information, creating the order. And it was very slow process, in part because all of that sy those systems that we're working with, they are not speaking together, right? It's not yeah, a closed totally. system. And yeah. now with TikTok shop, those inbound product sampling requests, we're getting upwards of a thousand requests a month inbound. And it's very easy to field those and get more product out into the hands of creators who, who want to talk and share our products. And so what we've seen today is, is just an acceleration of that playbook and an acceleration of commerce um, social commerce. And so I'm incredibly optimistic about, about the future of social commerce as it relates to the platforms. You mentioned that, um, it was Google who actually shared us in their global keynote when they announced, yeah. uh, YouTube shopping, uh, yes. earlier this year. And we knew, you know, they asked for some assets. We, we have been working uh, with their team very closely. We knew they were going to have some mention of us, but it just blew us away when we watched it live uh like we got so much coverage it was it was incredible and so compared to TikTok shop it's a much more mm -hmm. streamlined process and for us it it just works 
much more smoothly when you're you're creating those those ads and setting them up to run. That said, uh, Meta scales from an ad perspective far better than than anything else we've we've experienced. The sheer volume of traffic that exists within that ecosystem across Instagram, Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, et cetera. It's just unfathomable how big that is. Um, so it makes sense. On the TikTok shop side of things, I feel like in some ways you're kind of the, you know, becoming one of the the unofficial kings of TikTok shops. You know, you're, by my estimate, closing in on 10 million plus in revenue. It's almost a third of your revenue now is coming directly through there over the last few months. What outside of the kind of gifting, seeding, closed loop process, what do you think from an approach perspective has led to you guys being so much more successful than other brands? Um, and when you see other brands make mistakes, what are the mistakes that you're seeing them make? So for us, it, TikTok shop, when it came on the scene and actually we're coming up on uh, 12 months since starting on TikTok shops, we we're very early um, to the platform. Mm -hmm. um, we set up our shop back in mid-August of last year, and uh, it was before anyone really knew what it was. It really came out of nowhere. Uh, creators didn't even know what it was. And so once we had our shop up, uh, one of our biggest constraints after we saw kind of initial signs of success and started to really radically focus and lean into it, our biggest challenge was just activating creators, creators that were already talking about us and using our product in the field because we had been doing product sampling for 18 months leading up to that point. But now for the first time, those creators were able to um, lead to a transaction in a more efficient way um, for the consumer because even five years ago, coming from YouTube days, um, I was always under the belief that the, the sale actually takes place while uh, individuals are consuming the content. They really only click the description box below to go to our website to give me their credit card and shipping information so that we can facilitate a transaction. But really the um, purchasing intent begins at the point of consuming the content. And so the closer upstream to that, you can bring the transaction. Again, it's just, it's accelerating uh, this commerce flywheel that we're able to generate. And so for us on TikTok, when it came online a year ago, we had already done the hard work. We already were doing product sampling. We already had um, a lot of folks talking about us already. It was just a matter of opening the door for transactions to start flowing in. And then the magic of this closed loop system started to really work and accelerate. And so TikTok has always been the place where things go viral uh, and just spill out of TikTok. And now for the first time, it's products and commerce that has the ability to go viral and get this wave and momentum generated that just propels it in a way that um, is not possible without that closed loop system. And so for us, I, I would say we were able to find early success, able to identify that it was a place we needed to radically focus because we had already done the hard work of getting our products in the hands of creators. And so for new brands trying to find success on TikTok shop, I think that is a, a challenge that maybe folks are, are not prepared when they hear success stories, that there's actually a lot of hard work that is involved to get that initial momentum and traction started. But then once you get, get that snowball flowing, um, things just accelerate very quickly. Uh, that, that's been our experience. Yeah, I think once you build up that reputation and that brand, frankly, right, once people get to know you, they've seen you, they've heard about you, then when they see you in something that's more transactional, it's easier, right? The conversion rate will be much higher and their likelihood to purchase it will be much higher. I'm curious, you know, so at this point, your distribution is about half your website and then about a half TikTok shops and Amazon, TikTok being a little bit bigger than Amazon. Have you guys started thinking about retail? Do you have any ambitions of going there? Or is it something where you're like, nope, we're just gonna, you know, stick stick web only from a distribution perspective? We we are starting to talk to um, strategic retail partners. I think it's been a result of, it's not been an active pursuit, mm -hmm. uh, but folks are starting to knock on our doors. Uh, so we are having those conversations. We We do recognize it's certainly a part of the mix going forward. And what we're really good at is is generating that demand. And I think a good example of that is just taking a look at Amazon. And what we, we've only been Amaz on Amazon for for four months now. Yep. The reason why we got on Amazon was because the 
surge of branded uh, search term that buyers were looking for us there. And so it, it was a no brainer. And ultimately that was the halo effect that was spilling over from TikTok, from a lot of the, the activity we're doing on social. And so we have developed the internal muscles and we have that brand DNA that excels at building that demand off of a platform or out of a retail setting. But ultimately that demand can get expressed where customers want to find us. And so yep. what we found on Amazon is we, we sent products into FBA, we turned the light switch on and we, what felt like overnight, we had the, the top best selling um, products within our category in terms of new releases. And then even um, after we got, you know, continued sales traction, we have some of the number one brushes uh, on Amazon right now. You know, TikTok shop is an eight uh, figure channel for us now, as you mentioned, Amazon is on its way to become that as well. And ultimately it's a result of this halo effect from the, the demand that we're able to generate from this playbook that we've been running for the last five years. And we'll continue to radically focus on that. And so strategic retail, um, we want to be in a position that we can, you know, give it the attention it deserves when it comes online for us and really align with the partner uh, that is, you know, we find a good fit with, but it's certainly going to be a mix. And I'm super excited about that next chapter for BK Beauty when it, when it does come and then timing's right. Um, because for me, it, it's, it's something I get to experience with fresh eyes. It's almost like starting a new business, you know, developing mm -hmm. a new channel like that. And that's what I've, I've really enjoyed through this journey. Uh, you know, TikTok shop was our story over the last 12 months, figuring that out, learning that and excelling at it. And one day it will be retail. Uh, and I'm excited for that too. Yeah. I always liked the approach that, um, so this guy named Ken Landis. So he was the co-founder at Bobby Brown and he was the co-founder of, um, Tula and now the co-founder of Dibs, which, you know, have all been incredibly successful. And the thing that he talked about was he's like, I don't add a new channel until I'm number one in my category in that channel. And he's like, and for a variety of reasons, we call it narrow, but deep, I think is what's his mm -hmm. term for it. And it's because like, if you're the number one brush brand on Amazon, right, you get a lot of benefits, right? There's a lot of value to that in terms of, you know, the effort that Amazon's gonna put in, the ranking and visibility of that content, similar with TikTok shops. And same way with retail, right? Like if you're the number one brand in for that retailer in that category, you get dramatically more attention. And so it's been cool. It's cool that you guys have had the kind of discipline to only take on new channels when you know that you're going to have a lot of demand there, right? Like you didn't go to Amazon with no demand, which was pretty cool. Yeah, what's and you know, like Ken, I'm I'm a huge believer in radical focus. I think yeah. that is one of our superpowers, and that's what it's hinting at. And a good example of that is we were actually in the process of onboarding with Amazon last August when TikTok Shop popped out of nowhere. But what we saw in TikTok Shop was all of the elements that uh, again played into our our DNA and the internal muscles that we had developed. We knew we could be successful there because of what we saw them building. And so we dropped everything and started to radically focus on, on TikTok shop. We need to learn this. This is, you know, fertile ground and we're going to, going to be the ones to, to lean in. And, um, it, yeah, it did definitely, uh, provided a lot of opportunity. Again, it was, it was a wide open space, uh, for people to, to jump in, um, and figure out there weren't a lot of merchants on there or brands, uh, when we started and we got to the point where, we were operationally tested. Uh, we were battle tested. We do all of our fulfillment in house, actually, by the way. And so mm. the surges that we were experiencing as we layered in this channel that uh, was unknown and it just started to to go like crazy, pretty much you know leading into peak holiday sales season, right? So we had a, actually a couple months to get reps in to to prepare for um, you know the October November big surge that that we experienced on TikTok Shop. And it provided us a lot of attention from their internal teams. And so we, we got a great deal of support because we, we were able to demonstrate that traction. Uh, and we have a very close relationship with, with the TikTok shop folks. Um, and we've, we've benefited quite a bit from, from that position. Yeah. What on the choosing to do your own distribution side, that can't be super common. What made you decide to go that route? And 
what were the kind of investments on your side? I mean, you have to like buy a warehouse or rent a warehouse. You have to buy a forklift. Right? There's like just uh, there's process and structure there. What made you decide to go self distribution? So so five years ago we started in our living room, and yeah. every step along the way, uh, what what we've been fortunate to do is it's just an incremental next step up. And so over yeah. the course of five years. You know, we we are shipping now upwards of fifty thousand orders a month now at times, and that is continuing to to increase. Um, and so we've been able to get to the point where we can have the capacity to deliver at that level because we have made just incremental improvements, small baby steps to get up to this point. And so, why did we choose to to do it when most people outsource it to a three PL? At first, um, you know. When, when I started into e-commerce, the biggest thing, again, my background is business and marketing, but the biggest thing I underestimated was the operational complexity that comes into play when you're moving physical goods around yeah. the world and then shipping parcels out to, to customers around the world as well. And But what I've, I've found is I, I really enjoy it. I'm, I learn new things. Every day is a new challenge. Three months ago, my business looked very different operationally than it does today. Mm -hmm. And three months from today, it's going to look very different. So it, it keeps things fresh. Uh, it keeps me engaged and I can physically see what's happening by seeing these packages go out the door. And I would say another real big benefit is the stories we get to tell from a content perspective mm -hmm. to be able to literally our off our desks are within arm's reach of where these orders are being packed out. Our social team is is back there, uh, and so the content and stories we're able to share and bring people into this kind of authentic, you know, we we couldn't tell those stories uh, if we outsourced that component, and so that that certainly does provide a lot of value as well. And at, at the end of the day, uh, we we've certainly spoken with three PLs, and we're just we're just really good, uh, and no one is, I'm convinced, can do it better, faster, or cheaper than us. Super cool. Yeah, I mean the uh, cost there, or not the cost, I was just doing the math while you were talking. It's like four or five orders a minute per working day, right? If you did it to, just during working hours, that's a lot. That's wild. That's pretty cool. And I would say a lot of those orders come in kind of uh, kind of peak moments. And so, yeah, so it's, not. <laughs> uh, it's definitely not uh, a straight line. <laughs> it's, it's one of these things. And that is definitely one of the, the big challenges, but it, it's fun. I, I mentioned that we, we got on Amazon four months ago. We just experienced our first Prime Day, uh, which yeah. was last month. Uh, wow, that's crazy. Like that blew me away what Amazon Prime can deliver. But even though like Prime Day number one was our biggest sales day in company history, Prime Day number two beat it. Oh, wow. But our office was quiet. Like I was just seeing numbers you know, increment on a screen. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I couldn't feel it. Whereas we just finished the anniversary sale and, and yesterday was our biggest uh, fulfillment day. We set a, set a new record. Uh, Mondays are typically the heaviest in terms of volume of orders out the door because we don't fulfill over the weekend. And so it was just a massive day that we'd been preparing for. But that felt amazing to be able to, the energy and seeing packages out the door, uh, that's a good good feeling to have. And that that's definitely uh, a big motivation and something that I enjoy about keeping it in-house. It's weird it's to have your biggest, your biggest sales day of the company's history is just dead silent, but just watching numbers yeah. go. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> yeah. Super cool. So one of the quotes that you had on Twitter that obviously I'm a big fan of, I'm fairly biased, is you said that uh, media buying was how digitally native brands were built over the last decade and influencer relations is how it will be built over the next decade. Um, obviously, we've talked about that quite a bit, but give me a little bit more there in terms of why you, what made you come to that to that conclusion and how you've seen it. You know, have you dialed back kind of media buying pretty dramatically in terms of the way that you spend your money? Um yeah, talk to me how it affects budgets as well. So we we definitely uh, we, we spend about twenty five percent of our revenue um, kind of goes towards media buying, kind of traditional mm -hmm. ads and scalable predictable revenue, and so we anchor that kind of our, our budgets around that uh, and and stay healthy by keeping it anchored to organic growth and kind of overall growth of, of top line revenue. So we are still spending quite a bit on on paid acquisition. 
Um, it is definitely part of the mix. I think early days, we we tried to optimize for 100% organic and we were able to do that. But I we always had the card where we could pull out of our back pocket and engage paid acquisition to, mm-hmm. to continue uh, the, the growth path. And I knew it was part of the equation and it, it needs to be part of the equation. I, I'm a strong believer in that. But what I was hinting at at that comment in terms of um, the path to running an e-commerce brand or becoming, you know, head of e-commerce for a digitally native brand. Over the last decade, like that career path and that that progression uh, started with a media buyer and then kind of working the way up. And those are the folks that I see as kind of running e-commerce brands or had been and, and still ha- are today. But for a brand like ours, with the DNA that I've kind of described that's coming mm-hmm. out of the creator ecosystem, I am convinced that this next wave of social commerce, the progression and career path for certain brands, brands like ours, um, the leads in those companies and those brands will be the folks that started with creator relations, influencer relations, mm-hmm. developing those relationships, understanding the dynamics of, you know, uh, really understanding the the mindsets and motivations of, of creators. We were in a very fortunate position because when we launched our brand five years ago, my wife, Lisa, had been, you know, growing as a content creator. And so we were very well positioned from that perspective to understand the mindset and motivation of, of a content creator and how to, to work in that, that sandbox and that ecosystem. And so I see the future and what we've experienced with TikTok shop, what we see coming online in a big way with YouTube shopping. I'm hoping Meta comes uh, to the table towards the end of this year with more functionality that kind of aligns with this next wave of social commerce. And I'm a big believer that in that world, the the folks that are coming from the influencer relations uh, competency and skill sets within an organization will be the ones that are leading these brands of the future. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely, I think I open all of our conferences with like, you guys are the current and future CMOs of the world, right? Like 100%. that's my belief in terms of what these, what the community that we work with. And again, I think to your point, it's not every category, right? Like, right. you know, deodorant, people don't really talk about it. There's not a like community built around deodorant, even though right. native did a great job and others have done a great job in general. It's just not something that people talk about, right? But for categories that people talk about naturally, 100%. So one of the questions I have is you've had some expressed some concern over EMV in the past as a metric. Obviously, that's something that we have spent a lot of time thinking about. I'm curious where you see the flaws in that measurement and, you know, where you think there might be opportunities to get better on the measurement side outside of the pure kind of direct conversion part of it. Yeah, you're referring to a spicy, maybe a spicy take I had on Twitter. Uh, yeah, yeah, but- yeah. <laughs> But yeah, th- I mean, that's another benefit of, of Twitter. It, it engages feedback. And so when I put that out, I got a lot of feedback and get to learn and progress from there. And yeah. my views on EMV, it's a proxy metric. I think for us, the primary metric is GMV. Yeah. And so as we've started to shift into this world of social commerce in a, in a big way, led by what TikTok shop has demonstrated over the last 12 months and what I see the platforms migrating towards, I believe that sales, transactions, and commerce itself is more closely aligned with that full playbook that I described where from the creator ecosystem. And so in that world and those closed loop systems, you're more able to tie activity and what you're doing and what your teams are doing and the progress you're you're getting much more closer to GMV opposed to Mm -hmm. EMV, which is at the end of the day, it's a proxy metric. I think it, it's still a valuable metric to to monitor, track, and improve over time, of course, like don't get me wrong. But the challenge that some teams may find is that that is the goal, EMV. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it could invite unintended consequences or alignment that may not uh, ultimately provide outcome for the brand in terms of GMV, which I believe is is that ultimate stepping stone of what what you you should be working towards. And just for those that don't know, GMV is gross merchandising value. Is that the right terms, the right words? Yeah. But basically yeah, just sales, sales revenue, yeah, like, sales. you know, like sales. So I think, uh, yeah, that makes sense. I think that it's something that I think a lot about the targets that you set are what people are going to go after, right? And so I've seen it in our business, we're like, okay, we think this is a leading indicator for that. 
Right. And then people spend a lot of time and effort on that leading indicator, but actually, you know, they're doing it in ways that no longer makes it a leading indicator, right? Like it's like you're doing it in the wrong kind of ways. And so the balance I've tried to find is I know that people organically talking about my brand is good, right? Totally. And I know that that is 95% of the content, like 95% for brands like, you know, in the industries that we're talking about. And so the question becomes, if that's, if 95% of the content is not going to include a trackable link, is not going to include, you know, a coupon code, is not going to be part of a closed loop system. And that percentage could shift over time, right? It could go from 95 to 90 to 85 down the list. The question becomes, how do you value that? How do you understand the impact that it's having? And do that in a way that encourages the right behavior, right? Measure it in a way that encourages the right behavior from the actual teams, the marketing teams themselves. I think it's something that I spent a lot of time trying to figure out and pursue. So it'd be interesting. But yes, ultimately sales is what matters the most, for sure. And I think, you know, Connor, looking back to kind of our, our previous talking point, when we were talking about kind of the, the career project uh, progression of say a media buyer going up kind of the performance side of, of the ladder to, to running e-commerce brands or digitally native brands versus the, the influencer relations path. I mm-hmm. think grounded in that is this transition that now for the first time, uh, social teams are able to have a North Star that is sales and ultimately mm-hmm. to progress to where you need to be at, to, to have a holistic view and the lifeblood of any organization is is sales. And so I think because we're starting to closer, getting closer to mapping in, in a very straight line, you know, activity, you know, uh, social content, reach, and, you know, sales, and mm-hmm. it's black and white in certain areas today. And again, to your point, um, it's not as applicable to other, other brands. I think um, for us, We've experienced that on on TikTok shop. I think in general, um, their proxy metrics are are needed and required uh, across the board. Uh, But I'm starting to see first signs that you're able to more closely align kind of the social uh, wing of of a brand to to sales. And so I'm optimistic about it. And I think I I welcome any any way you can closer, more closely align sales with with activity and, and your marketing efforts. Totally. No, I love it. And I think, honestly, there's a reason that I've seen social commerce fail fairly repeatedly over the years. And so I go in skeptical because yeah. like yeah. Facebook tried it, failed. Instagram tried it, failed. Like I've just never seen it work. And yeah. so TikTok leaned in very aggressively from like a product. Like it was a very, very much like this is going to be the you know third pillar of TikTok. if you've got ads organic content and shop like that's the third pillar and it seems to be working which is cool and so i think the question becomes for brands where you know it's like 90 percent of my sales are through sephora like right you know how are you gonna close the loop right 100 percent um so one last question or you know we can do two last questions just because i know i'm using up a lot of your time here i've noticed you started to invest in collabs so you did a collab with maybelline which is super cool that you got in a brand i mean that's a big name brand that you're bringing in. I don't know, do they actually have brushes themselves? They might even have brushes, I would bet. So uh, what's made you start to lean in there? And honestly, I've been paying more and more attention to it. Like Elf leans in really heavily to collaborations. We had um, Terrence from Stanley on, he leans in super Mm -hmm. heavy. I just noticed it really working. What made you decide to lean into collabs? And, you know, what do you look for when deciding who to kind of partner with there? Totally. Uh, yeah, the Maybelline uh, opportunity was super fun, and I, I can break that out. But you know, collaborations in general, we do um, several product collaborations with other content creators, and that has been a huge in terms of co-developing products uh, with creators. And so I'll talk about uh, brand collabs from that perspective, and then also you know brand to brand collabs, which is is an exciting territory too. And I can share how we look at those. And what we look for, it, it, it's similar. And it really comes down to, for instance, on the creator side, uh, some of the key pillars of our brand are, are the educational component, right? And mm-hmm. so YouTube content creators coming with expertise in the beauty space, they share content that people are learning from. 20 years ago, when my wife was working at Mac Cosmetics, uh, consumers came to the, the retail counter 
to learn and educate themselves on the products and, and techniques uh, and what they should buy. But now they go to YouTube. And so uh, education is, is a huge component, entertainment, and just this authentic connection with the individual. I think once you get to looking at brand collabs, the Maybelline one was something that, that came together opportunistically. It was a lot of fun, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. I think the benefit there was just pairing uh, the internet's favorite or TikTok's favorite concealer brush with, with uh, an actual concealer uh, makeup product. And what we were able to do uh, was pretty awesome. And, and you mentioned like Maybelline, like it's a hundred year company uh, yeah. doing two, you know, billions of dollars in sales. It's crazy. And we're, we're just this uh, small little uh, story, but it was really cool to have that, um, that power that we brought to the table and, and we sold, we sold them out in, in four hours. And, yeah. and I think what you're seeing with, with Elf and what they're doing, you know, it's about creating these moments. And mm -hmm. I think creating these moments in social commerce and especially on TikTok shop, like that is what you should always strive to do. And I think brand collabs is one way to do that. We have a couple um, exciting ones coming down the pipe, but as a company that focuses, you know, most of our effort and energy on makeup brushes and tooling, we get to play very nicely with, with other cosmetic brands that are focused mm -hmm. more on color. And so that puts us in a unique position uh, to, to, to pair up with, with people's other favorite uh, makeup brands out there. I'm a big believer that there's no one brand to solve it all for for the makeup enthusiasts. There's enough room in every person's makeup bag for multiple brands. Yeah. And so, you know, we welcome uh, those collaborations. I think it's a win-win and it's a way that you can really create those moments uh, that, that are fun at the end of the day. A lot of fun. Yeah. And I think for consumers, there's something quite validating and fun about it as well to see them like, oh, shit, like. BK is hitting the big time, right? Like they're connecting with some of the biggest brands in the world. It like yeah, it cool. lends an incredible amount of validation to them, right? That they've chosen yeah. the right brand to support and they've chosen the right brand to invest their time in. Yeah, that that for us, I think looking to Maybelline, obviously that was that was a huge honor and uh, a lot of fun to do, and 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 certainly it provided a proof point and a point of validation that we're we're doing something special, and um, and that was a story we got to share. And it's about creating those moments. Yeah. Well, let's do one fun kind of end of show question. So what's the, uh, what's the spiciest take you've ever had on Twitter? And have you ever had to uh, delete a tweet after you published it? I mean, like, uh, maybe I don't want that to exist anymore. Oh, man. That's <laughs> a tough one. You're putting me on the spot here. Oh, man. I want to give you a good answer, but nothing's coming to mind. Has your wife have ever been caught up in controversy? I mean, she's got hundreds of thousands of subscribers at this point. No, you know, what's, what's interesting about, um, you know, my wife's content, our brands, what we've done from, from the beginning, you know, BK Beauty, uh, BK, the actual name, like where it came from, we have two young daughters, Brooklyn and Kate. Uh, yeah. and so it started there, but ultimately it evolved into more of kind of the, the story we wanted to tell. And so my wife coming from, YouTube world, obviously it does bring a, a lot of toxicity or it can, you know, in the mm -hmm. comments and, and feedback. And so that's what you're alluding to. And so we were very intentional out of the gates that we wanted to align our brand and what we're working towards, towards something positive. And so BK actually, uh, prior to launch really became known for beauty is kindness and really redirecting mm -hmm. the conversation to what is true beauty. It's really, it comes from the inside. My wife, Lisa, you know, was thinking about what we're teaching our daughters in terms of, you know, what is beauty, you know, what you put on the surface. And it, it's something that we wanted to, to definitely have a position on. And so BK, Beauty is Kindness, when we launched and, and still today, we, we partnered with the Kindness Campaign. And so we donated a portion of proceeds uh, to the Kindness Campaign to support their work. And, and ultimately, that drives uh, a lot of the purpose in our business, too. And so I, I think... Yes, there's certainly um, elements of toxicity that can come about in the landscape of social media, particularly on, on Twitter, but it also exists on other platforms, such as times on YouTube, uh, and there's controversy and, and gossip, and it's juicy, and you want to get into it. We definitely uh, shy away from that uh, 100%. I think one of the best examples uh, that comes to mind of that is we, you know, I mentioned we do a lot of product collaborations with uh, other wonderful YouTube partners, uh, creators. Yeah. Um, we had one of the, the biggest, uh, OG, you know, makeup 
creators um, in the beauty space come to us and want to do a product collaboration. It's something we really considered closely, but some of the the elements that that relationship would would be introducing to our brand didn't align with with the story I, I just described. And so I think some of the biggest challenges we've we faced along the way over the last five years is just saying no to big opportunities. Yeah. And that yeah. that's that's a big lesson that that I've learned. And so to your point, we try and, you know, again, there may be some spicy takes that you see from me on on Twitter, but um <laughs> but no we not too we're spicy. Not too spicy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. That reminds me of Beekman. Beekman has a similar, they kind of built the brand on love kindness. Beekman. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. And they uh and they really love it. So that's that's great. Well, Paul, congrats on all the success. Super, super impressive. And love that you guys have kind of carved your own path and taken your own path based on kind of first principles. Super cool. So excited to watch you guys blow it up. Continue to blow it up. Totally. Yeah. And Connor, uh, continuing to watch, I'm looking forward to your event that you're throwing. We just we just heard uh, and Sophia from our team uh, raised it up and once it, and I was just like, yes, we got to go. That looks amazing. <laughs> So congrats to you and everything that you're building and working on and supporting the space. We're huge fans and, and looking forward to the show. So thanks so much. And thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. We're going to have to get you as a speaker next year. We're like slammed with speakers this year, but next year you're on stage. We're talking about it. Awesome. I look forward right. to it. Later, man. Thanks. Be a friend, tell a friend, and subscribe. Earned by Creator IQ. Creator IQ is your all-in-one solution to grow, manage, scale, and measure your influencer marketing program. Ready to unlock the power of the creator economy? Get started with a demo today at creatoriq.com.